Yes, Kim. I'm resident of Follow with Jewel Saints for YouTube. I'm joined by my buddy Patrick McCray off of the Dark Shadows Daybook and Bound. Uh, we're here to talk Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, starring Gene Wilder. So, Patrick, when did you first see this movie? Uh, okay, so I was born the year this movie came out. And uh, it was a flop at the box office initially, and it vanished. And so, you know, it takes relatively forever for something to get to television back then. And I think it was maybe six or seven years later, which is an eternity in kid time. Uh, you know, I think it was maybe 77 or 78 that uh, a, a babysitter uh, mentioned that this movie was on. It was a, to her, it was a big deal. And, and I just thought, you know, well, I've never heard of this thing. So, it, you know, I was all of six years old. And if I hadn't heard of it, then it wasn't important. It didn't exist. And uh, so, so, you know, put it on our black and white TV. And, uh, and it was really strange. So why is this, why, you know, why is this American kid living in Munich or, or you know, where he goes, weird German town? And it's this very strange sensibility. Um, but it was mesmerizing at the same time. You know, I was familiar with Gene Wilder from Young Frankenstein and Sherlock Holmes' Smarter Brother and things like that. So he was recognizable. And uh, yeah, so that's when I first saw it. But for a long time, because it didn't really take off on video until the mid 80s, yeah. even though it did have a successful run on HBO, I think around 1979, 1980, uh, for a couple of months. Uh, I was uh, I kept being a real advocate for the movie, saying, "Hey, you know, this is this should be one of the great children's films of all time." And it's great because it's a children's film that's not childish, no. you know, which I think is a, a brilliant thing. It's what George Lucas lost sight of when he made uh, *Phantom Menace*, is that he suddenly says, "Oh, it's a kids' movie, so it has to be kid-like." No, no, it doesn't. Um, so that was my history. What was your history with it? You're right. This movie is not, though it's made for kids, it's very adult. It's, in yes. many ways, it's, you know, we've talked about how adult Dark Shadows is written. Um, this is written very much adult. It's, it's meant mm -hmm. to send a, give a message. And it does the, just that. I saw this movie, let's see, 1991. My mom showed it to us, and it was just, I I had only seen one other musical, and that was The Wizard of Oz. And okay. this movie really, really touched me in a lot of ways. Here's this young man, like, you, he is American, you're right. And his, you know, his family's very poor. And he's, you know, they have to watch how they, you know, live and stuff there. There's, you know, his grandfather is, seems not to be in great, the greatest of health. And oh, well, why would you say that about an elderly man who hasn't been out of bed in 10 years and subsists on cabbage soup and yet no one changes the sheets? The, this is imagine, what, imagine what that bed's, bed's like. It's Jesus, God. There are four, four elderly people with collapsing digestive systems eating nothing but cabbage soup on those sheets. Wow. I, I, I got to tell you, this movie, it, how, for, for me, this movie was very fun to watch as a kid. And Slugworth, uh -huh. I hated Slugworth. I mean, they... they sure. You know, they did that right. Um, and the, the yeah. twist at the end, I won't reveal, but they got that. You mean where Slugworth looks for Willy Wonka and is actually in it? Like, no, don't reveal it. Jewel, this movie's been out since 1971. Everybody's seen it. There's no one watching this. I love you to death, pal. But I, I you, don't, you don't need to worry about spoilers with this one. It's okay. It's yeah, okay. so Slug, Slugworth. His real, yeah. That's not his real name, and he works for Willy Wonka, you find out by the end of the movie. I think was one of the best 
twist in the movie? Because it would make sense. Yes. How, how does Willy Wonka know so much and know so much about the kids? Well, Slugworth, you know, tried to bribe, like, hey, I'll, I'll give you this much money if you get me something from, you know, Willy Wonka's factory. And But Willy Wonka, he wanted to finally bring people back into his factory, but a select few. So he made, he he puts a golden ticket. There are only so many tickets in the chocolate bars, which were big. By the way, did, did when you when I was growing up, I saw Wonka candy. I never ever found one goddamn chocolate bar. Well, there's a reason for that, uh, and it depends on the era. That they later managed to make a Wonka chocolate bar. It just didn't sell very well. No. When Quaker Oats, see Quaker Oats initially, they they paid for the movie. Yeah. And and the thing that they did was um, when they when they were when they were putting the movie together, uh, their whole thing was uh, let's uh, you know let's let's you know make some money off this, and they had they wanted to start a candy line anyway, okay, yeah. so so Willy Wonka was the way to do it. And um, the problem was, is that the 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 candy bar that they made, uh, all of the other candy really worked. You know, it was good, but the chocolate bar they just like the chocolate river in the movie. Yeah. They could not quite get the consistency to what they wanted it to be. Yeah. So that was that was the problem. Yeah. It it's very interesting because there was I mean there was a lot of Wonka had a lot of fruity candy and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I remember that as a I remember that as a kid. Um, even though this movie came out in the seventies, I wasn't born till eighty two. Yeah, um, there was still Wonka candy when I was a kid. In fact, there still is Wonka candy. Oh yeah, I mean the 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 brand of of Wonka as as candy because he got sold to a real candy company eventually. Yeah. And uh, you know, not to besmirch Quaker Roads, but you know, you just don't think of them when you think of candy. Yeah. Um, and so it got sold to a real company, and there we go. That it it finally uh, took off, and I I think it's a it's a saleable line even to this day. With this movie, there's a it has great musical numbers. What's your favorite musical number from this movie? Interesting you should mention that. Um, I am I am a real fan of the music in this movie. Um, I uh, <laughs> really um, Anthony Newley is the guy who wrote the, the music for the film. He also uh, he wrote a lot of very sentimental songs in the '60s. Uh, he had a couple of musicals, um, uh, but his um, his greatest mark on popular culture was the song Goldfinger. Yeah. He he wrote the he wrote the music. <laughs> for Goldfinger. So um, uh, that's kind of his uh, his 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 lasting legacy. That and I would say Willy Wonka. Oh. So. Um, uh, what is my favorite song in the movie? I, I you know, I would say uh, "Pure Imagination" yeah. is is easily, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm with you on this one. That is one of the best songs in the movie. Um, it's terrific. Yeah, it is. Just it describes the factory and everything, basically in it. And well. It does, and it does something. It does something else. It's a. It's a very, very, very. It's a very odd song, because this is a movie where it's kind of like Dark Shadows, in that there is a lot going on in the film, and it's it's unclear whether or not uh, the people who made it knew how much was going on but that is uh, 
that is a very spiritual song. Mm-hmm. Uh, throughout the throughout the movie, Willie is kind of almost portraying himself like God. <coughs> is he there to reward or punish? It's hard to say, but uh, if you want to view paradise, simply look around and do it, you know. Uh, and I, I forget what the line is. He has another lyric in that uh, song uh, that also has sort of godlike implications. Um, you know, we we are the dreamers of dreams, he says earlier. So... Um, Pure imagination is uh, not only is it a, I think it's in a minor key. It's it certainly has a sad kind of quality going on in the background, um, but overall, uh, it's a it's a beautiful haunting piece which Anthony Newley was really good at. And guess who Anthony Newley was married to? Yeah. Joan Collins. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Edith Keeler from City on the Edge of Forever. So anyway. Uh, uh, that's my long-winded way of saying pure imagination. <laughs> I gotta tell you, if I if I if I'm picking another one, it's definitely the Oompa Loompas. Uh... <laughs> okay, <laughs> they're just hilarious, and they're amazing characters. You, you get, you know, who who's helping Willy Wonka run at this giant chocolate factory? Well, these these little Oompa Loompas are. Yeah, um, have you read the have you read the book? Do you know about the actual Oompa Loompas? No. Okay, well the Oompa Loompas were slaves that had been carted over from Africa and were fed on they they ate uh like he gave them cocoa beans oh. for yeah, for their for their pay and it was unbelievably politically incorrect as you know, you can imagine. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This was a uh, this was this was a very problematic thing, and they um, I, in later drafts, uh, Roald Dahl kind of changed it, but they really changed it in the uh, they really changed it when when they got to the movie, because suddenly they are these you know, bizarre kind of homunculi, you know, creatures, seven, seven, you know, strange little men who look like Gerard Stiles in a way. These are the unofficial children of Gerard Stiles. Well, I mean, I mean, look at, Ger- look at Gerard's kind yeah. of that little suit that he's in and his hair and all of that. Yeah. See, I, I'm with you on this. James Storm inspired the Oompa Loompas. Uh, every way. I'm just gonna say there, there are some, there are some similar. No, similar there are. The, no, there are. I agree with you there. When you watch, uh, when you watch Gerard Styles, especially as Judah Zachary, 1995, and then you see Gerard Styles in 1840. Yeah, you you could you could sort of see some Impaloopa inspiration where, where they may have got it from. Um, but this movie, they you know they talk about poverty, but there's just like Dark Shadows is about class, so is this movie. Um, yes, there's a lot of you know rich society, work society, po- you know, uh, poor man as well. Um, by the way, there's a Dark Shadows cast member in this movie. Um, the girl who played oh, Amy Chris, Jennings. Yeah, Amy Nichols. Jennings. Denise uh, Nicholson. Yeah, Denise Nickerson does a hell of a job in this movie, too. Mm-hmm. I mean, she just great, great job. Um, what's something that you take away from that with the whole class thing? Well, certainly that there is a nobility in uh, in a humble background. Yeah. You know, all of the other kids, this, this story kind of exists to shame children. You know, uh, oh, did you, did you see the ad on TV? Do you like the ad on TV? Well, here's a kid who watches too much TV. Yeah. Did, you, did you enjoy the concession stand? Yeah, well, there's Augustus Gloop. Did you enjoy the concession stand, but you got gum? Well, there's Violet Beauregard. 
Yeah. Uh, did, did, it was this like a birthday party? Do parents take take a bunch of your friends here? Birthday party? Really? Yeah. Well, have fun, Veruca. Um, you know, I, it's just it's relentless. Yeah. Uh, and all of those kids have some sort of advantage that Charlie doesn't. They've got a TV. They've got wealth. Mm-hmm. They've got food. Other than, you know, Augustus Gloop, one going to get fat eating cabbage soup. No. Uh, you know, considering that's all Jack Alberson ate, I, I'm amazed that Charlie had any appetite at all. Um, you know, such, let's just face it, uh, Violet Beauregard has the most superficial of snacks. Mm-hmm. She has, and here's, here's Charlie, can't afford candy. And here's Violet, who loves a candy you don't even eat. Yeah. I always thought gum was the dumbest food on the planet. What do you mean you put this in your mouth, you chew it all day, and you don't even eat it? That's just crazy. I don't. I still don't understand it. It's okay parents, to Reynolds, but that's and, it. And your parents tell you not to swallow it. They didn't have to tell me. I just wasn't interested in gum. <laughs> My mother told me. <laughs> Did she say a hand would grow in your stomach or something? No, she just said, whatever you do, don't swallow it. I'm like, well, what do I do with it then? Because when I first started chewing, I'm like, gum's like candy, right? And she's like, well, yeah, but you can't eat it, so don't swallow it. She goes, do I have digestive now, problems? Wait a minute. Hold on. I'm going to check something out here, Jewel. Because we've been hornswoggled too long. Can you swallow? Oh, God, not that. Gum. Okay. Can you swallow gum? Although chewing gum is designed to be chewed and not swallowed, it generally isn't harmful if swallowed. So there, that's from the uh, the Mayo Clinic. Uh, yeah, I think I think you're all right. Uh, it's, it's, if you, I think you can, you can do it one piece at a time. Um, you know, and you don't want to do it every day. Uh, your digestive system can move it along through the normal intestinal activity. In other words, it comes out the other end. When is swallowed gum a problem, Jewel? Well, I'll tell you. Swallowing a large mass of gum, as I've warned you about, uh, can block the digestive tract. So, you know, keep in mind, you've got acid in your stomach that can eat through a battleship. You've got acid in your stomach that can destroy viruses. So, I don't think gum is going to do a lot. I think you're going to go. So my mom lied to me. God damn it. (laughs) She didn't lie to them. I I think they worked with the tools they had. Yeah, I mean, I this was the generation. Did you meet anybody who was like crazy about MSG? They were going, oh, Chinese food, the MSG, the oh, I feel so awful. It's MSG. Do you remember those days? Yeah, but it's nonsense. It was not. It was. It was like speculation in one medical journal that got shot down immediately. MSG is a naturally occurring thing. It comes from seaweed. Yeah. And it doesn't do any of those things. It just makes flavorful things more flavorful. And that's it. It's the same thing as accent. I really I really like how in this movie... <laughs> You're bringing we, it back. No, we do, we do see the different lifestyles of people and how they live. Not just the characters were, that are going to go to the chocolate factory, but the people who are in the outside world themselves. You see casual people going into the store just to buy the chocolate bars to hopefully get a golden ticket, but they're having to spend the money to do it. And then you, the other character, the other characters we do that are going to go into the chocolate factory, and how they're how different their lifestyles is from each individual. I think it was really, really well done. It was. Um, it was. And really well demonstrated throughout the movie. And even in the Chocolate Factory, especially. I mean, to me, Gene Wilder in this movie has, in my opinion, the best character entrance I've ever seen. Um, how oh, the, the cane and the... Yeah, he... he <laughs> there's so many rumors. Here's a guy who... There's so many rumors surrounding him in his Chocolate Factory. And he's coming out and he looks like he can barely walk. And he... It goes, it's, 
and sprints up. No, I'm not done. I'm, I'm, we're, we're, we're still talking. And it's really, really cool. And I'm just like, to see Gene Wilder in this movie is just pure joy for me because I had already watched, by the time I'd watched this, I had already seen uh, the producers, I'd seen Young Frankenstein. So it was really cool to see him as this really crazy, kooky character, you know, seemingly. Because it's like, what, what's, what's with this guy? It's, and they go into the chocolate factory and you get, you get the cool songs of the chocolate river. Just looks crazy. Uh, the whole factory does. What did you think about the inside of the factory? Uh, you know, there's a guy named, I believe, Harper Goff, who I, I may have gotten his name wrong, but I think I got it right, who designed Disneyland. And he was designing Disney World. And he's the guy that got to do all the Wonka interior production design. So it very much to me feels like what you would what you would see you know in in a situation like that uh i think it's a brilliant piece of production design because it's it looks like this could be the weird way that wonka has designed this place or it could be a complete sham it could be a complete construct that he has made because it's basically this is a test he has managed to get different demographics from different places. And, you know, I mean, all white. <laughs> so how, how different really is that? But, um, well, I guess Violet isn't towards the end. But uh, uh, the, uh, but, but, you know, these, all these waspy characters. Um, you know, I mean, this is a test as to who's going to take over. Not just this candy empire. But this bizarre technological empire also that he has. Mm -hmm. And so sort of see this as an obstacle course. And, uh, and so you can look at it like this, like this thing that's just been injected into the factory. And in fact, what took so many years was building this thing. You know, We've got to make it look like what they think the inside of the factory is. Um, uh, or, or this really is the way that Wonka runs things, but it has a visually consistent look that is all its own. And I like that about it. Yeah. It's really cool when we see the inside of the factory it meets every expectation you have about it. It does. And I really like the fact that Gene Wilder as, as Willy Wonka as your host he meets he definitely meets your expectation he is just he's so cool but yet so like fascinated at the same time but then i love when the oompa loompa is whispering something to him he goes oh no i won't hold you responsible in the mother <laughs> it's great I and mean, it's just it's wonderful like he sells it so good and Gene Wilder, I know he didn't like the uh, remake of this movie, um, but with, with the original here, it really brings a lot of, it tells a really good story, a good heartwarming story. Despite all the, when you look at the, par, yeah, there's poverty in this movie, but I think that that's more for a heartwarming effect, and it comes across that way too. It's not, It's not like cringe, which is good. You don't want something to be like, when you're watching about poverty in a movie, you don't want to necessarily have it all like be cringe all the time. It's not necessarily cringe here. It's something you look at and you feel sorry for Charlie's family. And, you know, in my opinion. And when they when he when he gets the ticket, I love how he gets the ticket. Like he's you know, he's opening the bar, he's not sure, and then he gets it. It's really, really good. And then there's Slugworth is around the corner. Seems to be around everywhere. Always a Slugworth. You yeah, know? he he really. I think that's the thing too that for for kids movies, when you present a heel, you want to present a heel that kids sort of like are looking at. Like, man, this dude's just creepy. And at my age, yeah, I, I looked at Slugworth like he's a creepy dude. Who uh, is the, who is the villain of this movie? Would you say? 
in my opinion, the villain, <laughs> the villain of this movie, the overall message of the movie is there's many messages in this movie, but the overall villain is, in in a sense, is life decisions and how how we handle our own our own decisions and how we sort of react to other people's decisions too. Where throughout the whole movie, people are making decisions in the factory, especially. So, you know, Violet and, and the boys, the grandpa and Charlie drink fizzy drinks. And Willy Wonka brings this up. But, and then they burp and stuff and they come back down. I always found that moment interesting. But really, everything in the movie has been one big giant test for these kids, mm-hmm. and see who takes over the factory. It's n- it's a test on their character, on who they are, what what kind of person are they. But we're also getting a glimpse of what kind of person Willy Wonka is. And Willy, when Willy Wonka says about that that Charlie failed, and Gene Wilder is sitting there, and Charlie and his grandfather. We'll we'll just we'll we'll give Slugworth a, you know what he wants a golf stopper. And Charlie looks back, thinking, "No, that's not why I came here," you know. And you could sort of see that in the actor's eyes, and I like that. And he he puts the the piece of gum. He puts it down. He puts it next the golf stopper. I think golf stopper, Mister Wonka, and he he sets it there. And I love what uh, Gene Wilder's character says because it lets you know that the person really Wonka is looking for is somebody who is going to make good moral decisions no matter what. And it's really about making good moral decisions no matter who's around you. No matter his grandfather... Think about this. Charlie's biggest influencer is who? His grandfather. Mm -hmm. His grandfather is saying, We'll we'll give we'll give Slugworth the the job stopper. He does no one knows. Keep in mind, we're gonna find out what we're gonna find out, but nobody knows that. Charlie doing what he did, it's like, look, I love my grandfather, I respect my grandfather, but in the same sense, I'm my own individual. And that wouldn't be right. And he puts the gobstopper next to Wonka, knowing it wouldn't be right, and he's not going to do it. And that right, it's a, it's about being who you are, not being, not about being what everyone else wants you to be. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, very much so. Um, uh, is is there does the movie come down on the side of their existing fate? Um, of of each character? Just in general. I mean, are certain characters fated to be the ones who go in? You know? I think I think in every way it's yes, it is somewhat about fate. That they're all fated to go into the the chocolate factory. Now you could say, well, luck factors into it too, which I do think there is that too. But I think these characters are, look, it didn't have to be Violet, this person, but it was going to be one person from each class of of society. That's what it was really going to be. And then there's Charlie, who's the poor, who's, it, it could have been in another poor kid. I think, these kids who got who got the ticket were just it's fate. They're going into the factory. Yes, they they lucked out. I mean, but really, you know, luck 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 only gets you so far in the story. There's got to be some fate to it because I truly believe Charlie was somebody who was meant to see it. The inside, at least. I agree. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, do they, what, what is the fate of the kids who went in? Do they survive? 
they survive. They all sur- Well, Wonka says they all survive, which they did. That okay. I agree with. I'm not. I'm not just saying that because the character says that. And I'll, I'll carry it this much further. They survive, but whether they change as human beings or not is up to them. From the experience of what they've had here, is completely up to them. Thank you. If, me. if they don't, then that's up to them too. And <laughs> if they continue to let, that's another thing too. All those kids that, mm-hmm. that made those decisions, they did make those decisions. Because the one girl is so defiant of her mother, she's just a complete brat. Um, they all are, in a sense. But yeah, I mean, none of them are are prizes, right? They all they all choose what they choose. Each kid, and really, that's what this movie is about too. So whether they become good people or not after the experience of the of Willy Wonka's factory mm-hmm. is in their hands. Um, and I think that's the best way to view it. It's, it's not. It was never Willy Wonka's job to make these people good. It was always their job to choose to either be good or do the bad or do bad things. And they, the kids who got ousted of the factory, they made, yes, they all made bad decisions. But were they life-altering decisions at that point in their lives? No. That only comes after the factory, and it's now it's still your decision of where you want to go with your life after the factory and who you really want to be. I'm not meaning, I'm not meaning their job profession. I'm meaning who they are as people. Are you now going to change your ways from what you've learned inside the factory? Who who do you think is there a kid who gets maybe is not as bad as the others in terms of the villain kids. It's rough because people are, people might call me a homer on this one, but I'm going to pick Violet. I don't, I don't think Violet, again, each character had their faults. But okay. I do think a lot of these kids, once they get out of the factory, are going to go, they they're got they're either a going to come to their own realization of what they did and what they did wrong, and learn from that, or they're not. But I do think most of these kids did, with the exception of probably one or two. I don't know which one of the one or two are, but I think most of them probably walk away with the understanding of okay, I can't really be like this because where where has being like this really gotten me? Yeah. You know, and I think that's the message too in, in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. You only get what you give into life. You only, you can't just take, 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 take because that doesn't get you anywhere. And you have to, you have to be a good, really good person to get, and an honest person to get the most out of life. You know, that's a that's a very worthy observation. It's something I've always viewed when I view Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. So, Do you, uh, when how old were your kids when they saw this movie? Uh, my kid, well, my kids were both ten when they saw this movie. Now, they haven't watched it in a while, so I do need to show them it again. But my kids were both ten, and my daughter just. My kids, well, my daughter was 10. My son was a little younger than that because they're not exactly the same age or two years apart. But my daughter was 10. My son was eight. My daughter, when she saw the Oompa Loompas, she just thought they were hysterical. She was like dancing with them. So she uh-huh. liked to dance. Um, like when, mu- when music comes on, my daughter's on the dance. <laughs> so. And she just enjoyed the movie as a viewer. So I probably need to show them it again. I hope they, when they watch it as adults, they get a lot of the same messages that I got. So you haven't, have you have not had really like super heavy conversations? No, I do want my, I want my kids to figure things out, not just by themselves, but 
they do need to figure out for themselves at times. Because the one thing my daughter's had trouble with, you know, is when my daughter makes a decision, she always thinks the decision's wrong. That every decision, oh, I made a mistake. I made a mistake. Not every decision is that decision. And that's something I've tried to, we've, for years, me and my wife have told her, but she still does this because she's so unsure of herself and her own decision making. And that's something we've been trying to work with her every day at, but it's still her with her autism and my son's it's, it's very tough to get across to her that, okay, if, if I asked you to, if I asked her today, Hey, what do you want to eat? She'll say, and I'll say, okay. And she could say, well, no, no, I made a mistake. No, it's not a mistake. If that's what you want, fine. Now, or like if you ask her, hey, do you do you want to do this? She could make that decision and say, yeah, I do. But then she'll be like, oh, no, I made a She thinks everything when she changes her mind is a mistake. The first thing she made was a mistake. And it's like, no, that's not what that is. Okay, if you could pick, I'm just, I'm just picking your brain. If you could pick one movie to show her that you think she would get something out of that would help, what do you think it might be? This would this would be it, but for me, the one thing I I would love to show my daughter, if I could, and they do need to release this, is if if I could get her to sit down and watch it would be maybe Mr. Rogers, because that's something that helped me too. Um, watching Mr. It's, Rogers, you know, Fred Rogers was somebody who really connected with me as a young boy. And he really connected with, with a lot of other kids. And he did it by teaching you and showing you many different things and sometimes the things he talked about were very edgy too i mean he wasn't he didn't pull his punches and he was very he come across as very honest and forthright no i mean i remember his obsession with the kennedy assassination and he spent several months just pouring over those pruder films again and again and again ranting about the warren commission talking no he didn't do that wouldn't it be great though wouldn't it be great? Uh, Fred Rogers, pretty amazing guy. Um, mm -hmm. Military background. You know about that? No, I didn't. Well, that was World War II service. Really? He was. Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. As, as from my from what I know, uh, Fred Rogers was uh, a force to be reckoned with. Oh. Yeah. I mean, he was. Uh, Mr. Rogers' TV show is kind of him doing penance in a little way. He he was very good at solving certain problems. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's something I would love to just sit my daughter down and show, and I think she would finally maybe understand, okay, your decisions you make are your decisions. It's not always a right and wrong decision. Yeah, there are going to be those decisions that you make in life that are either right or wrong, but you won't know that until you've made them. Yeah, I mean, I know that most of the decisions I'm making are wrong, but I, I make them anyway. Uh, but that's that's me. That's why, you know, you don't have her Uncle Patrick around to, you know, talk about these things. It's just to think to and say, no, don't do whatever it was he did. <laughs> Captain Object lesson. <laughs> what's, what's, um, what's, what do you think the message of uh, Willy Wonka is? Uh, the message of Willy Wonka is to be content, to find, no, not to be content, that's a sheep, to find contentment, to find wonder and imagination and all of the splendors of the chocolate factory in life, in wherever you are. If you listen to the song, Pure Imagination, that's what it's about. When he says, you know, we are the dreamers of dreams. That's that's what he's talking about. 
and um, and all of these other characters are trying to find pleasure in something other than in in the present, in where they are. You know, Augustus Gloop, he's eating food all the time. Mike TV, it's, you know, television. Uh, with, uh, uh, you know, it's just such a coincidence with his name, too. <laughs> uh, Violet Beauregard, this gum fetish that she has. Uh, uh, you know, Veruca Salt, who just wants everything. A, the ultimate materialist. And also, what terrible parents they have yeah. as well. And that, you know, there's this great line that... Uh, that I'm going to misquote, but it's when they're in the boat and uh, Charlie says, you know, boy, this is really kind of scary. And, and Uncle Joe says, yeah, it is, but it's interesting. And and they just kind of enjoy it for what it has. You know, I mean, they don't quite enjoy almost getting chopped to death when they drink the fizzy lifting drink. But uh, but other than that, you know, they really they they are mindful. They're respectful of the environment. Yeah. of what's around them you know if wonka says don't do this or don't do that with the exception of the fizzy lifting drink they don't mm. and uh and they take a genuine sense of wonder in in what's going on and you know even in the house uh, you know I, I feel like they're kind of making the best of it so uh it is to find the the moral man finds uh, happiness and finds contentment where he invests his heart and his imagination. Mm -hmm. It is not up to the outside world to invest heart and imagination in him. And that's why Charlie is appropriate to run the factory. Yeah. So I would, I, that's the message I get. Yeah. Really, really good. Um, what do you give this movie? Scale of one to ten. Oh, uh, what, let me ask you. When, when, when we talk about that, what is a, what is for you? What does a ten mean? Perfect score. I mean, a ten means they had the best. They wrote the best story. There was the best acting performance and the story was just phenomenal yeah i you know because i think of a 10 as there's no room for improvement you know yeah. uh and i would uh i would i would call this movie a 10 yeah i agree straight 10 willy wonka and the chocolate yeah. factory is yeah but uh, if you want to watch the remake you can uh but <laughs> well yeah uh, i'll, well, I'll Tim Burton shows his his natural magic for taking properties from around the late '60s, like Planet of the Apes or something else. I can't can't quite put my finger on it, and uh, and completely uh, doing something that I don't want to see. But stick to the original because it's really really great. Um, great, one. and it's fun to watch with the kids. Yeah. Uh, speaking as a father, uh, but really really great movie. Now, we are doing Jaws Friday. Um, right. Sunday, uh, are you and Gordon available for a Dark Shadows episode? That's that's tomorrow night, right? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, at 11 p.m., um, I do have a movie for next Sunday, if you're game. Okay, what, what do you want to do? You'll, you'll have to find it. I own this on DVD. Right. I'm going to have you watch the 1995 anime classic, Ghost in the Shell. Ghost in the Shell. Okay, that's fine. I mean, that's commonly available. I think you'll enjoy the hell out of it. Um, it's a famous, famous film. <laughs> it, I mean, it really is. It's it's a big no. deal. No, it is. It's really, really good. Uh, the series is pretty good, too. Um, so, see you guys tomorrow night. I'm really excited to talk about sort of the reboot of Dark Shadows. Um, really, really good. So, Patrick, my friend, it is always a pleasure. Link to the Dark Shadows Daybook Unbound is going to be in the description box. Uh, oh, wait, before you go, is there anything you want to add about uh, Willy Wonka? Uh, it's a great movie. Yeah, absolutely. Patrick, my friend, you have a safe night, sir. Take care.
You too. Bye-bye. Bye.